this morning on a, a page that pops up on my um, computer when I turn it on from a news source, which just summarizes a lot of different blurbs. The top article was an article, actually a Gallup poll. Gallup is a famous poll to do uh, testing, polling in the United States at least, and they have affiliates in other places like Ecuador. And I actually downloaded the article. I thought it was interesting, but very sad. They did an article and it showed that in the United States, a so-called Christian nation, in a poll that they just concluded, they ask the population, how many of you believe the Bible is a book that can be taken completely literally? And from the last time they did the polling, or at least the one they compared it to, it had dropped in about half. It was down to about 20%. Only one in five people said that you could completely take the Bible literally. And that's a very, very sad, sad thing. It said about half the rest of the population said you could, the Bible was a, a useful book or there were things in it that you could take. And often the attack comes starting with Genesis 1-1. In the beginning was, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And when that is thrown aside, people say, well, you know, if I can't believe that, how can I believe everything and the rest of it? There's good teachings and et cetera, but we can't completely trust it. And so the topic today is to continue what we've talked about on some of the things of ready to give an answer. Um, and in this case, it's the topic called intelligent design, which we'll look at and compare it with the theories which are still so heavily pushed, Darwinism and neo-Darwinism. So that's where we're going to start. Um, the key points I want to uh, talk about today are that certain features of the universe of the cosmos are explained and can only really be explained by an, initial, an intelligent cause, not an undirected process such as the natural selection or, or matter appearing out of nothing at a big bang or some giant concentration in an almost an infinitesimally small space uh, that has all the matter in the universe. Doesn't make sense. It, everything that has a beginning, as we've said many times, has a cause. God does not have a cause because God is eternal. And so, one of the things that's seen in the universe, and, and there's all these sort of things that to me make no sense because there are some people have tried to say, okay, the water on Earth is coming because it collided with another planet that had water and that sort of thing. But if you look at even the, the template that was used for this PowerPoint, the Earth is a, a sphere, round sphere, a very close to perfectly round with the mountains and the, the relief on it, but the, the basic sphere is very close to being completely round and it has different layers. So explosions don't produce layers. Co collisions with other planets would not produce layers. And so starting with those things, but those seem to be passed over. And so one of the topics that not really something we'll talk about very much today, but the origin, structure and fine tuning of the universe are evidence of intelligent design. We, we see how the, the earth is going kind of crazy as far as, as rainfall and drought. Eastern East Africa is in their worst drought in 40 years. The Western part of the United States, and Paul can attest to that, at least maybe more South, but perhaps in Washington too, is in a drought situation. And other parts are getting hit with floods. Uh, we've been overloaded with water here with a lot of landslides. And so things are getting out of balance and the calculations, whether we want to accept them or not. I can't say that they're right or wrong, but less an increase of a couple of degrees is going to be a very major problem on earth. And so the fine tuning, which, which we as stewards haven't necessarily done a very good job of, of keeping or causing problems. Living organisms are much too complicated with too much structure and information to just be a result of accidents. And so, so as we start that and we say nature requires a designer we're going to look at even what Charles Darwin said as a test for his hypothesis and see how it's failed, uh, how it, 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 it can't be proven. So just some verses, because I think that's where we need to start. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1-1. This is not a time-dated thing. 
There's a gap very clearly between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. So we don't have a time basis on that, and that's not the subject. We've talked about that before. Then you have the present creation in which we are living. It said God saw everything that he had made in Genesis 1, the end of 1 and beginning of verse chapter 2. Everything he had made, behold, it was very good in the evening and the morning. For the sixth day, the heavens and the earth were finished and all the host of them. So God made the things. There is no other explanation. Things are far, far, far too complicated to have just appeared out of nothing. And, and yet people continually blindly want to believe that because they want to deny the existence of God and the responsibility before him. We'd be in the same position if it wasn't for the grace and mercy of God to us. John 1, 3, and 4, all things were made by him with us. Without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And then he, we know more of a wonderful verse at the beginning of Hebrews 1. God, who in sundry times and in diverse manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. And so it's clear that specifically it was his task within the the deity, the trinity, to make and sustain the universe in which we live. And then a verse that's been, I've, I remember how often I thought, well, apply this to the, the indigenous person in the jungle or someone in a, a, an Islamic country or a communist country where they don't have access to the Bibles, don't have access to, to the gospel. Um, but I think Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 20 can easily, just as easily, be supplied to the PhD uh, woman or man in a laboratory that's doing scientific research and has an opportunity to see the creation. They may never pick up a Bible, but they have facing them right in the eye. The evidence for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Behold, in truth, the unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God has showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. I think it's interesting there that it says the invisible things, because... When we look at the creation and try to explain it apart from God, it's impossible. But also in our lifetimes, uh, some of us are a little older, are living in the time where, for instance, the uh, structure of DNA, 1950s, was, um, was brought out before. And we'll see this in a few minutes. People thought life cells were just a blob, but as, as things go on, and, and as the scientific techniques get better, it shows even more and more and more the invisible things from him, the creation of the world, the complexity of it, and yet the perfection of it, except when it's been damaged by sin of human beings. And so the question is, and I'm going to say why talk about watches. Uh, there was a man in 1802, I think he was a believer, that he said, if I walked along in a field and I saw a watch sitting there, I wouldn't say, oh, that watch just appeared out of nothing. That watch was a, a process that, you know, certain metals and glass and things uh, actually blew together and they formed this working watch. You'd say, I would look at that watch and say, oh, this has, has a maker. It came from an intelligent watchmaker. It's too complex to, it's not a rusty piece of metal that's sitting there in, in the field. It's something that's too complex from that. And yet one of the key opponents of what we're going to talk about today is a, still a professor at Oxford, Richard Dawkins, but in 1989, he wrote a thing called The Blind Watchmaker. And he said, well, you know, the evidence of evolution does, he tries to say, it reveals the universe without design. He said, it just looks like it's designed, but the designer's not God. His purpose, his only thing that he'll listen to is it has to have a naturalistic explanation, absolutely defying the supernatural. And so he said, the things that we see yeah, over time with massive chance coupled with natural selection, it's like, well, these different pieces could be put together and, and you'd have a watch, you'd have the equivalent of a watch in nature. So when we listen to that, we realize that that's absolute foolishness. And so one of the other things that's a major change is when I was going through 
school and getting science classes in biology in junior high school and high school, I remember a series of four four horses, and they said these are the this is the evolutionary change of horses, and yet they've shown that they didn't come from the same periods that they they weren't in the order that they were showing us in the textbooks. On the other hand, there's a lot of things that they say, well, there's similar functions. You know, a dog and a human walk and run. And just like we say, an analog watch and a digital watch both serve the same function, but we realize that inside they're different. They, we see the screen in a different way. Yes, we can tell time with both. And so one of the things that's been kind of blown out of the water in the last 20 or a little more years is showing that once they could start analyzing DNA, they could say all these things that were the appearance, what we will call phenotype, and we'll talk about that later, really did not reflect what was in the genes. It was the designer used different gene sets and things in many different ways. And so we'll go on from there. And so we have a comparison, and I don't know if my, my top part of my screen keeps showing up if I'm blocking the top of it or you can see it. Um, but on the left, this was Darwin's theory. He said natural selection, that was the original theory. He said you get these minor mutations and you, these mutations accumulate over time. Uh, and, and I worked with roses for many years and I've probably walked through at least 40 or 50 million rose plants and greenhouses and in some in very, very much detail and found a number of mutations and colors. And we realized that there are some things that mutate easier, like a color of a rose is something that's easier to do. And when you, when you do the breeding, we try to set 60,000 seeds of roses a year, and you go through a selection process. It's a defined selection process, not the survival of the fittest, but you're looking for the ones that grow the best and have the most interesting colors and that sort of thing. But selection doesn't cause a mutation. Selection doesn't do things. And so he didn't think, well, you know, you had these things as isolation for a major component, but basically said, you just keep taking these mutations. We started out with a single celled organism and we've got up to this tree, which we'll look at later. The only problem is the tree is missing the trunk. It's missing many of the branches. Uh, and so what changed the so-called neo-Darwinism, which you may have heard about today, is a modern version. And what happened is once they started having access to the genetics after the Watson and Crick uh, decoded the, and f discovered the structure of the DNA molecule. And now you can do uh, the genome. You can, you can break it apart and get the, the order of the genes in a human or a dog or a rose. And so now the process added, um, and not just saying these are these mutations, but now they say, okay, we understand more about genes. You accumulate the things and you get these variations, you recombine the genes, you select, and then you have things separate like the finches and Galapagos or, or whatever. And so now the, the biggest thing is to say, okay, you, you have these things on the islands in the Galapagos or in the British Isles or wherever it is, and these accumulate to get a change of species. You can look on YouTube and there's, there's a questioning of people who are, um, scientists or people studying science and they say, okay, tell me where this has shown that this accumulation of mutations allows you to go from basically one phyla or even one genus to another genus. I mean, where are we seeing dogs turning into cats if I can take it to a, an extreme thing? And they can't, give a, a, they can't give reasons. They can't give examples because that God has defined things and he's, he's allowed limits. And in, and in a sense, yes, it's, it's good that there are mutations because sometimes it spares us. It allows us in agriculture, for instance, to find varieties that are resistant in a population to a disease that's come along, to an insect that's come along. But that was the Darwinism thing. And, but it, it still talks about these small incremental changes that add up to big changes. Does the fossil record show that? No. So here you see, you know, they had these things of the variation, everything else. And finally, now that we understand a lot more about genetics, we have the, the modern synthesis. So, so the accepted theory by so many has been neo-Darwinism. It's these small accumulated changes that add up. But the problem is, and many scientists are recognizing that it doesn't explain 
what the reality is. And we're going to go on and look at that. This is, and I couldn't really, I just did it in a, a representative form. Um, the, the people's view before we had what we have now and microscopes now and electron microscopes and everything else. The early view was that a cell was a simple, so-called simple cell was something very, very simple. It was really kind of a blob of like jelly of uh, protoplasm. It, it wasn't something that had a structure. But if you look on the right, that is what is recognized as the structure of a simple cell. If you were to unwind the DNA in the cell, uh, it would stretch out to something like six feet. You have, uh, you have all these different processes and all these different things. It's, a, it's actually a working factory in a cell that in many cases is can even be seen in certain cases by a light microscope. You'd have to use an electron microscope. But it's a process that is, is working with micro machines basically within it to, to manufacture proteins with the instruction from the, from the DNA. And you're, you're, you have the ATP synthesis, which is, uh, which is something that's like something that keeps bumping a gate open and it rotates and it, it's what provides energy for the things within the cell. You have the nucleus where you have the, the brain, the, the uh, and so you just have a tremendous number of different things there and it has to be able to have membranes that, that share uh, material, can absorb and, and release material and everything else. There's no such thing as a simple cell. <laughs> Probably the uh, most simple cells have sometimes as much information as there is in a, the programming of an airplane or more. And so that, that has kind of been blown out of the water. And yet all these things said, oh, we're gonna start with some simple cell. They have never been able to make one. The, the, the wall of, a, of an animal cell has different layers of lipids uh, and, and they, they can't, they've tried many times to make these lipid layer walls, which are necessary for the in and out flow of, of materials. They've never even been able to make that, even if they had all the things and they tried to stuff them in to make a cell, there's not been one living cell made. And so when people go along and say, well, in this, this pool of, of this certain chemicals under these certain conditions, these things came together and made something. When people try to say that, it's a fantasy. They've never made one and they are not even close to doing it. Uh, and so to try to say that this is happening on planet Earth, or we we sent a we Hubble went out and took pictures of another planet somewhere which has similar conditions and maybe there's life on those on that planet. Um, if you want to talk about science, this is not looking at something in the past. This is not looking at rock formations where you have the evidence just like you would look at a crime scene. This is something that's very present. If you want to say that this could happen, make one. And start out with just the atoms, uh, a, uh, the the atoms in a in a strand of DNA um, in the human body. I think they passed something like three billion. Remember the exact number. And so Darwin came up with this this uh, tree, and he said, "Okay, you look down at the bottom, and you say amoebas." And those of us who've spent a lot of time in Latin America. Um, realize that we've probably had some bouts with amoebas. Uh, and so he goes up and he all the way at the top of the tree is, is human beings and gorillas and orangutans and, and that sort of thing. And this is just a tree for animals. Well, you know, the tree looked nice when he did the picture back in the 1800s. He said everything came from these simple cells, which we understand are not simple now. And then by natural selection, accumulation of mutations, we have all these different branches. But by the time I was studying some of these things in the high school and the university, they were talking about punctu punctuated equilibrium. They said, okay, well, the things seem to make steps forward. We don't understand it, but when we look at an organism and in the Cambrian layer, the Precambrian or whatever, it's, it's different than it was in, in previous things. So somehow you get these massive changes within, um, within a, a the DNA and it, we get this organism that's quite different. Well, I think if you want to look at that and say that, you know, does that make sense? No, it doesn't make sense at all because who's doing the programming? It's like someone 
saying all of a sudden you have this code generator, random code generator, and it 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 puts in a whole bunch of new code and it it all functions to me, sorry, makes no sense. And it really does make not make any sense in a scientific point of view. But what we're battling against is the fact that people want to explain their existence totally apart from God. And so it's interesting that there was a man, Luis Agassiz, born in Switzerland, became a professor at Harvard. And um, the, the request of, uh, of uh, oh, go backwards. The re sorry, the, the request of, uh, um, of Darwin, because he was a contemporary of Darwin, was to please review my manuscript. And this man was recognized as a total expert in fossil records. And, and he was trying to say, does the, the record in the fossil um, record, does it, does it match? Does it, does it support what Darwin is saying? He was a Christian, believed in creation. He had some difficulties, which didn't help his reputation. So-called accused, I don't know whether it's true or not, of having certain racist thoughts. But if you look in Wikipedia or something about the man, the problem is um, they say, well, you can't believe him because he was, he was a creationist. Well, question is, if you want to close your mind, your heart, to the evidence, which is what's happened with so many scientists, that's what we're going to come up with, because many people refuse to accept the fact that we are, uh, we are, there is a God, we are beholden to the supernatural, to that which goes beyond our understanding, our power, an infinite, eternal God. But what did he say? He said, you know, Darwin, Charlie, uh, you know, there's a number of species and that, are, that all of a sudden appear in certain rock layers. And we're going to come to that in a couple of minutes. And he said, they're not in other layers. If you look in the previous, the previous layers that have been laid down, there's nothing like that. And so what you're seeing are these giant steps, new, new things appearing. And if we even think about the creation of we, in which we live, started 6,000 years ago, basically, uh, when the, the clock started in Genesis uh, 1, not Genesis 1, 1, but when the things were found, we start in Genesis 1, 3, in the condition where God started by his son, the Lord Jesus, to create things. We are living where it's not like a lot of these things which were seen in previous creations are seen. Um, there's distinct fossils, distinct records, and everything else. And so there has been multiple creations, very clearly. And so what he said, Charlie he said, small scale variations never produce a difference in species. And what happens is the large scale variations, whether achieved gradually or suddenly inevitably resulted in sterility or death, like monstrosities, they die out. And so if you have someone who has, for instance, even a human being or an animal that has major genetic problems, uh, they usually turn out to be fatal for the person. And if there's these major changes, they're not even in a position to, to mate. There's not a male and female that match it. So Darwin himself said, okay, the beneficial changes were rare and minimal. And macro mutations, these big ones inevitably produce deformity and death. And so we see that most of the mutations we'll find in a rose are non-functional. They're not, they're not good. Maybe one in 20, 30, or 40 might have an interesting change in color that you can use. But generally, mutations are negative, not positive. There are exceptions to that rule. And so Darwin laid out the challenge. He said, you want to, you want to test my, th my thesis? He said, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not have possibly been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. If we're looking at a screen right now, think of the different parts of, of our eyes. You know, you have the pupil and you have the, the nerves in the back and you have, so you have all these different things that, that function together, the cornea, uh, and then you can have all of those things. And if you don't connect it to a brain, the signal means nothing. There's, there's nothing that can process. There's nothing in the eye that controls opening and closing or, or uh, the, to allow more light in, to allow less light in. We don't make that decision that's made for us by our brain. 
One of the examples used by a man called Michael Behe, who has been very key to this, he's a professor in the state of Pennsylvania, biochemistry professor who's been attacked a lot, but has written some very excellent things and he's very high level scientist. He said, take a, take a mousetrap. Mousetrap has what, five parts or so? He said, you take away any of those parts and the mousetrap doesn't function. You don't have a base, well, how, you don't hold things together. You have to have something to catch where you put the cheese and when it, when the mouse steps on the hammer, you know, and flops the, the holding bar forward, um, that uh, he said, if you take away one of those parts, it doesn't function. So he came up with the concept of irreducible complexity saying, hey, if you can't make it any simpler than this, it doesn't, you take anything away and we have multiple things starting within our body. Just one example is the human eye. We're using it right now. And we realize that if you took any of these things away, it wouldn't function like it does. And so some definitions which are, are interesting. The genotype is a term that some will remember back from biology classes, the, the genetic, or you know, Paul or someone knows, knows it far better than I do. It's a genetic makeup of an organism, but then you, you put that organism, whether it's a plant or whatever in an environment and the expression of it is the phenotype, what it looks like. And so when they were doing all these comparisons back before they understood the genetics, all they were looking at was the so-called phenotype, the expression of what it looked like. And they said, okay, this descended from this and this descended from this. There are certain organisms that had something that could sense light and that was the early part of a human eye. Well, when they could now look at the genetic sequence, they found that wasn't true. And then there's something else, diversity differences pre precedes disparity. And so what, what they were trying to say and what their, their theory is based on to say, you start getting these diversity and the things begin to separate and the different file into different genuses, et cetera, different families. And as these things diverge, you, you get your different things that have appeared. The problem is, and we're gonna look at it in a minute, and I said to Brother Morris, we're gonna look at Bridgewater. Uh, there's, a, there's something that happened and they're, they're dating and not by carbon dating, but by radioactive dating of the rocking rocks and believers but, and I'm no expert in it, so I'm not gonna, but about 500 million years ago is how they date this particular level of things. All of these different types of phyla, these different groups of animals, the chordates with the back, backbone, the, the arthropods that have an external skeleton, these were not present in lower rock formations and older rock formations, and they all of a sudden appeared. So the fossil record did not agree with what, Darwin said there was this big gap and so you see these different things happening so the question is this what we understand is something different we understand that in the ark God put the different species and so I had a note you know who gets who gets to go when we look at all the different dogs and we've got two dogs in our house and I can hear them uh, um, walking around outside the room where I'm at um, if they were a clean animal, they went in seven pairs, 14 of them. If they were an unclean animal, they went in two. Well, these animals went in, but they had the genetics to get these different, and people have continued to breed, the different breeds of dogs. And so what we understand is, yes, it starts out in a specific thing. And from there, within the genetic pool of an animal, you get the, the diversity and they were trying, they've tried to explain it on the opposite way that you used to get the diversity uh, first, the separation. Well, God's made it so that in the, what, 7 billion or whatever human beings on earth, there, there's a diversity when there's differences in color and height and weight and in characteristics, but we, we share a common gene pool uh, which allows, and, and then they, of course, understand that there's certain recognition of genes that are characteristic of certain areas, certain races, et cetera. And so there, it's an opposite view to what they were saying. Well, what happened many years ago, and if you're, you, if I was Brother Morris, if you want to, you're, you're only a little over two hours away from a very, very key uh, thing. You go from Bridgewater up, Near, near Bristol and you cross over to Newport and you go beyond Swansea and things, you come to one of the most famous rock formations in the world, the Cambrian 
rock. And the thing about the Cambrian rock that's, that's interesting is that um, Cambria is another word for all or part of Wales. This is a rock formation that was known back in, in Darby's time. He wrote about some of these things and some of the collected writings. And, and this is a formation that has been very, very key because this rock formation and it's found in British Columbia and it's found in different places around the world. Uh, this layer, there were a number of, of uh, phyla of different rock, of, of different animal species and groups of animals that appeared that had never appeared before. And so they, they've tried and tried and tried. And I remember back when I was in school and they said, well, they'll eventually find the fossils. Well, they haven't found the fossils. There's another in the province of Yunnan, not very far from where actually most of the roses are produced in China. And there've been some famous Chinese scientists. And so just a little over two hours from Bridgewater, there's these rock formations, which have been very, very extensively studied over a period of probably over 200 years. And this has presented a challenge to the Darwinists, the Neo-Darwinists that they have not been able to explain. And they, and so if we go on because of the sudden appearance of things, and I'm gonna read something written by Stephen Meyer, very, very uh, imp interesting author. He uh, he's did his PhD in the philosophy of science. He's written some excellent books. I've got down below Darwin's Doubt, which I'm currently reading and, and the author's signature in the cell and things. And he, I'm gonna read this because much better to say it from his word is, infinitely more of an expert in this. The term Cambrian explosion describes a geologically sudden appearance of animals in the fossil record during the Cambrian period of geological time. During this event, at least 19 and as many as 35, 40 total phyla made their first appearance on earth. Phyla cons constitutes the highest biological categories in the animal kingdom, with each phyla exhibiting a unique architecture, blueprint, structural body plan. Familiar examples of basic animal body plants are Sinarids, corals and jellyfish, mollusks, the squids and shellfish, arthropods, the crustaceans, insects and trilobites, the conoderms, the sea star and sea urchins, and the chordates, the phylum, to which all vertebrates, including humans, belong. The fossils of the Cambrian explosion exhibit several distinct features. Cambrian rocks display about half or more of the basic body plans or architectural designs of the animal kingdom. Representatives of 19 of the 40 known phyla definitely made their first appearance in the fossil record during the Cambrian explosion. Three phyla appear in the pre-Cambrian, that was before that. Six animal phyla first appeared in the fossil record after the Cambrian period and 12 more are not represented in the fossil record. Well, this is there, the evidence is there, whether it's in British Columbia or whether it's in Wales or whether it's in China, and those who've studied it have hit a wall because how all of a sudden you have these things formed. And so we'll see some other examples, but the Cambrian explosion, layers of rock, which have trapped fossils and even some cases of soft-bodied animals. And these things like the vertebral cord, which we have in our back or the, or the crustaceans, the insects, which have an external uh, shell, whether it's a shrimp or whether it's a, it's a beetle. These things appeared all of, all of a sudden. It wasn't, uh, wasn't something that happened over time. And so these are the rock layers. If you look at the top, this is a couple hours away from Brother Morris and Judy. So Judy, um, and the Cambrian is at the top, the pre-Cambrian is down below. And I'll just make a, a brief comment. People have tried to force everything into the flood. The flood left very definite characteristics, but the problem is the flood is very difficult to explain that you would lay down one layer of rock underwater, because normally the rocks have to be heated to, to have this happen. You layer down one layer with one group of animals, and then on top of that, and sometimes these things get inverted, I can show examples uh, when I drive out to farms and of rocks that have been turned upside down by, by uh, volcano, excuse me, by earthquakes. Um, they're, they're separate layers with separate rocks and many times they don't share the same thing. And, and if we were to look at what's living today, we don't see dinosaurs walking around, but we see animals that were not present in these other creations. And so God has chosen 
to make what he's made through his son in each one of them. And so just to try to understand this, the top is what, um, what Darwin said it was. This is like this tree. And then, then they try to look at the example and they say the punctuated equilibrium. So it wasn't gradual. It was like steps taken in time. But the problem is the reality, the, the, the uh, fossil record says, look at this. These were like this at one time, then there's a change. And now what's, what's appearing and what appeared between the Precambrian and the Cambrian and where we live right now in, in, in this creation, they're different. They're not, they're not things. And so this is what the record is. And so when people try to, try to defy these things, they're really defying science, not just God, they're defying science. And so I say sometimes, yeah, someone may not be one willing to listen to the Bible, but it's not a bad thing. And especially with students in school and things that have to face these things to be able to understand that, that science is, is cooked over. What they're writing about in their, their own articles, it's one of the comments Michael Bay, he said, yeah, write in the, read in the scientific articles and they can't show these changes from one species to another. But when they write a textbook, they're dishonest. They're faking it. And, and so the evidence is there. Um, thankfully, our eyes have been opened, not because of intelligence or anything on our part, but because of the grace and mercy of God. And so Michael Bay, he grew up going to parochial schools. And it's curious. He was taught evolution in the Catholic schools that he went to. And I've got a copy of the, the Bible that's used uh, in Ecuador in religion classes in in, in parochial schools, but also in some of the public schools. And the sad thing is even in the notes of the Catholic Bible, it teaches evolution. Uh, and so no wonder the battle has been lost in many ways with many people, but he, he did his PhD in biochemistry and read a book that started to question many things. He said, okay, you write this in the textbook. So I'm going to the library and I'm gonna look up the articles and he couldn't find them. And so, what he did is he started to study the DNA. Very brilliant man, very interesting. If someone's interested in it, there's some very interesting talks you can find on YouTube under Michael Behe. And then he wrote a book and he, he called it Darwin's Black Box. Got it many years ago, probably at least 20 years ago if, or more. And in this, he said, okay, you can say all these things. You could say this descended from this and that descended from that. But he said that, that worked fine until we could uh, start to decode the DNA. And he said what the DNA showed was not that. He said the DNA didn't say that, that you know, humans were descended from chimpanzees or whatever. He said the DNA said something different. It's interesting that Stephen Gould, who we've mentioned before, the very famous biologist from the University, from University of Harvard University in Massachusetts said, after he was presented the information from Michael Behe, but before he died, he said, it's gonna take us 30 years to figure out an answer to this. But that's not what they said in their, their public testimony, their, their popular type of articles. And so some of the key components that are they're what we call intelligent design and, and Michael Behe, Dem, Demsky and Stephen Meyer that I mentioned before are ones that have coined this term to say, when you look at the reality, you look at the creation of the, of the species, the, the living organisms, when you look at the structure of the universe, and they have others looking at that from the cosmos uh, and the different layers that there are on earth, as I've mentioned before, um, why do you get volcanoes? Because you get material going underneath the surface of the earth, being reheated by radiation under the earth, and that's what heats it up, expands it, and causes it to replenish what's lost by erosion. If that radiation were sitting on the surface of the earth, we would be in big trouble because we'd be burned up by it. We're in fact, one of the ways that we can see so many stars is that we're out on the spiral galaxy of the Milky Way, but we're not in the, so the Milky Way has its core part more dense, but it's incredible the differences between stars. We're out in a place between arms. If we were in a place that we were where the arms are too close, they say that the radiation would be much more dangerous than it is for us now, even with what's happened with, uh, with some of the loss of the, the ozone layer and things. We're, we're much more protected than we would be in different parts. So even God placing planet Earth where he placed it is 
is vital. So what's specified complicity? A specified pattern is one that takes short descriptions and it's something that's simple. Um, you take, I've got a glass of water sitting on my desk. A glass of, the glass is something simple. It's a melted sand formed into a, into a form that you can put water or other liquids in it. Where a complex pattern is one that is unlikely to occur by chance. Dembski argued that it is impossible for a specified complexity to exist in patterns displayed by configurations formed by unguided process. And he says his argument is that complex patterns indicate some kind of guidance in the formation, which is indicative of intelligence. We're all connected in one way or another, whether it's on a phone, a tablet, or a laptop, or a desktop. And the only reason we can be connected is because there have been programmers that they have done the code which makes it possible. And no one's going to say, well, that was happening by a random coding that had to, it, it indicates intelligence. And yet the living organisms are far more intelligent than, than computer programs. And so one of the things, and this is a quote from intelligentdesign.org, molecular machines are another compelling line of evidence for intelligent design. Is there no known cause other than intelligent design that can produce machine-like structures with multiple interacting parts? Um, so we have these things. Let's just look at the, you know, the cosmos. It says all these, these things came from matter, space, time, and energy came in at a very specific point in time. Carl Sagan, famous astronomer, as we've mentioned before, said, oh, the universe is all that there ever is, was, is, or ever will be. But we know that the universe is spreading out. We know that if they're making the calculation that 5 billion years or something like that from now, planet Sun will be out of energy. So if the universe was from a past eternity, it would be burned up and separated by now, no matter how slow things happen. But it was very important when someone came up with the Big Bang, not because that's the answer. It's because of the creator, but because there was a recognition finally that this universe in which we live is not eternal. It's not self-existing. It had to have a beginning. And so it's a finely tuned thing. So that's one side of the, the argument. We're going to look at more of the biological part today. It says every cell is complex and has integrated micro machines. And so Darwin said, okay, you show something that can't be occurring by uh, accumulation of micro mutations, uh, and my theory is false. Well, it's been proven false multiple, multiple times because uh, who's going to write the code? You look in it today, and, and yeah, we can do certain things by, uh, we, we all know now what a PCR test is, or at least what it functions. It's a rapid multiplication of a segment of DNA and they look for it and then multiply it. And if you've got COVID, it shows up. I did an antigen test last week and just recovering, but really no symptoms now of COVID. But you take that, that stretch of DNA and you can put it in another plant, another animal, whatever you're working with. Uh, but no one is out writing code to code a new organism. They may take something, DNA from one organism and something from related organism and put it together. And they usually find that it functions much less, but no one is out writing code to make proteins, to fold those proteins together so that they can be functional. Um, and so this battle against the reality is we're battling against absolute materialistic explanations, which don't hold water. They, they don't have a scientific basis. And yet how many young people, how many believers have been tricked because they've been sitting in classes where they're presented false information. Very sad, very dangerous. And so here's one, one example and it, and I wish I could download it. It's, it's pretty heavy. If you're interested in it, it's fascinating to see this bacterial flagella. It has, was originally thought 30 different proteins. Now they say it may have up to 50. And it, this, this can move, it's, a, it's the flagella, it's what, propels a bacteria around in, in, in a liquid. Excuse me, I need a liquid right now. This bacterial flagella has all the different parts like you would have in a motor. It has a drive shaft, a rotor, bushings, bearings, a universal joint. Uh, it can move, it can rotate at speeds of up to 100 thousand rotations per minute. And that's 
That's an insanely high amount of things. Uh, it self-assembles. It takes the, you know, the 30 basic, but they say it can be up to 50 proteins. And so what they've done is they've taken this apart. They've sometimes found a way to take one protein away from it. And when you take one protein away from it, it doesn't function. And so for this to function, if Darwin was right, you'd have to be able to have this progressively done. And so they've found something that's simpler. They say, well, this is the precursor. But when they, when they track the dating on it, this, this simpler type of flagella came later. So it, it's absolutely the proof of a designer. And so Darwin said, going back to it, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. The probability of making one protein by chance, by putting together amino acids of 150 protein uh, amino acids in a row is calculated at one over one to the 164th power, impossible. And yet this took 30, at least proteins, every one of them essential. They all had to be there present and they had to make this micro motor which could propel something at, oh yeah, bacteria, something very simple. Yeah. It, it's not simple. There's no such simple thing about it. It's an incredible micro machine and there's multiple ones. And so Darwin's theory has been absolutely proven to be false because uh, there is no scientific explanation to make 30 proteins to do this. So keep going. Well, DNA, you know, has five different atoms, but in, in each DNA molecule that's inside your body and my body, in the 6.2 million base pairs, uh, 23 chromosomes, every, every DNA molecule has about two, a little over 200 billion atoms. And our, our body has an estimated 20 to 25,000 different genes, which make proteins and all these different things to make our body function. And if you're going to try to say, we're going to come up to that, we're going to approach that by accumulation of mutations, ask someone who's suffering from sickle cell anemia or autism or cystic fibrosis or Down syndrome, which in many cases are the result of just one mutation of a gene. And so if you think, if there's, as Michael, Michael Behe has talked about devolution, things going backward, if we have a negative mutation, it can be very serious and can be horrible for the person who's going through some of these different genetic diseases. Well, if you're gonna to try to approach the, the being fearfully and wonderfully made as we're reminded in the book of Psalms, going the other way, you say, hey, no, that, that makes no sense. It doesn't make sense at all. Where, where's the coding coming for this two, over 200 billion atoms? Where's the coding coming for 20 to 25,000 genes when so far no one's been coding genes? They've been, you can take them apart, multiply them and put them in another organism in some cases, but doesn't mean you're writing code. And so Darwin put his, just in summary, Darwin put his, out the challenge to his theory. Science has proven that the challenge cannot be met, either of Darwinism or Neo-Darwinism. The fossil record, including the Cambrian explosion up the road from Morris and Judy and things defies the principles of gradual mutations and natural selection as a source. Intelligent design says that the universe and things require vast amounts of information that cannot be explained by chance. It's still attacked because people do not, if they do want to reject God as their father, the Lord Jesus is their savior. They don't want to accept that there is, it's not all just by chance. But thankfully we know the Bible tells us who the designer and creator is, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Sometimes people have questioned the people in, in um, some of the key ones in intelligent design have maintained generally the separation of the science from the explanation. But the last book of Stephen Meyer, The God Hypothesis, uh, says you can't explain this apart from God. And that's what they realized the vast majority, but not all the intelligent design community um, are, are believers, but we're thankful that we have clarity, and I think it's important to share the message to young people who might be facing some of these questions, some of these attacks, and say, hey, there is an answer. Uh, 
We know who the designer and creator is. The eternal power in Godhead is very evident in the creation. We'll just maybe we'll close for the word of prayer. If there's any 